Today we have two special guests from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. We're going to talk about a special program for using high performance computing for manufacturing. Okay, Aaron. Um, oh, sorry, I had to unmute. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Robin Miles uh, has been with uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, for quite a few years. Uh, she uh, is our third um, HPC for Manufacturing Director, and she's been uh, doing that for the past couple, couple of years. Um, it's more than a full-time job, um, and it's a, it's a very inter interesting program. I think you guys will, will, will have, uh, I think the professors in particular will, will be interested in it because we, we do, uh, we have started funding uh, work out uh, into uh, universities, and I think the students will uh, have um, a uh, a good time uh, seeing uh, how some of this computational math and physics can be applied um, in the real world. So uh, go ahead and uh, take go ahead and take it, Robin. Okay, yeah, this is Robin Miles. I am the director for the High Performance Computing for uh, Energy Innovation Program, and uh, and Aaron Fisher just talked. He is the project manager for this program and also a PI on several of the projects. So I'm going to start by giving an overview, and then he's going to jump in and talk about some specific projects that he's been engaged in. It's uh, really uh, very interesting. We've we've funded over uh, 100 projects in this portfolio over our portfolio and worked with about 40, over 40 different companies. And most of the PIs really enjoy these uh, projects. So let me see if I can share the screen. Um, all right. Okay. All right, do you see that? Yes. Okay. All right, let me put it on presentation mode. Hold on. Okay, there it is. So uh, again, Robin Miles, the director for the High Performance Computing for Energy Innovation Program. It's a program that's sponsored by DOE, and here are the DOE sponsors down here. Uh, there are offices of energy, uh, the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, uh, and the Office of Fossil Energy. And within EERE, there are several of the sub offices that support us. The main office that supports us is the Advanced Manufacturing Office, but also Vehicle Technology Office, uh, Fuel Cell Technology Office, and Building Technology Office uh, fund some of these projects. And we work, um, although Livermore Laboratory is the lead laboratory, we work with eight different laboratories uh, throughout the National Laboratory Complex. So the idea of this program is that uh, we're really helping industry to improve its uh, computational capabilities and it, to maintain its competitiveness and to uh, save energy for our offices of energy. But as you'll see, uh, or as you'll know, that there's uh, this misrepresentation of industry out there that somehow industry is dark data, is dark, uh, dirty, and dangerous, and we ha it uses all sorts of old technology, and no one wants to work on it because they don't want to get their hands dirty. And in fact, uh, manufacturing has gone through a huge re revolution of late. They use robotics, they use um, added manufacturing, and in this case, we're trying to help them to uh, increase their competitiveness by using advanced uh, computational tools. So uh, why are we engaged in this? Well, the national laboratories are experts in high performance computing, as you probably know, uh, that we have uh, uh, several, top seven of the top 10 computers out there in the world. That list is always changing, but uh, we're always in the top 10 computers in the world. And uh, not only are we, do we have these large platforms, but we have uh, the folks like Aaron, who's gonna be talking later, who have spent literally their entire careers using these uh, platforms. So we have folks that specialize in how to rewrite programs so they run optimally on the new architectures. And then we have a lot of people who work on applications areas, uh, the advanced application, and we do we use a lot of computational fluid dynamics and a lot of material uh, specialists, those sorts of people. Those are in high demand. And uh, the idea is that we can take all that talent and our computational platforms 
and use it to help our customers save energy on the national level, whether it's steel making uh, that Aaron will be talking about that uses a lot of uh, energy and, and could use some improvements in the process, uh, paper, another big energy users, chemical industry, lots of big energy users who could really benefit uh, by using our computational capability to help uh, the nation save energy. So the reasoning behind using HPC is that, first of all, we think that while uh, some uh, industry capabilities are out there, there's still a factor of 100 to 1,000 times less in speed, if you will, or computational capacity uh, to the national laboratory. So the national laboratories are in kind of the forefront. And by having these large resources, we enable a lot of things. Uh, we can enable more accurate um, models that uh, give you more accurate results, whether you're looking at new materials or whether you're looking at these uh, co combustion or computational fluid dynamics problems. And uh, having these very large accurate uh, and also or a large problem area type of um, models, you can also use that to do better optimization. Some of our, the folks, it's hard to believe, but some of the folks, uh, when they're doing some of their modeling, it takes them a few weeks to run one model. Well, okay, if it takes you a few weeks to run one model, can you imagine trying to do hundreds of those to get a more optimal result? It's, it's a lot harder. And of late, of course, we're using all those runs that we do to feed into our machine learning tools, uh, to train the machine learning tool. And it has allowed us to do some very interesting things. Uh, not only to improve uh, designs, but also to uh, do real-time process control uh, with some of the machine learning tools uh, very rapidly. And that's actually paradigm change, actually. If, if you think about the history of control systems, you generally think of a bunch of sensors out there, and then you write some PID loop or whatever to, to take that information in the sensor and uh, modify your controls. Now we're actually inserting uh, computational uh, modeling into that control loop, which uh, has huge advantages in many processes, especially those that can't really use sensors very well because they're um, extreme regimes. Uh, so, uh, so we are enabling those sorts of new uh, technologies. And then, what does this uh, do for industry? Well, it will allow the telephone in time. What was that? So, uh, so it allows industry to uh, make, produce advanced project products, shorter time to market, higher quality, and improve their processes. Whether it's increasing their yield or using less material or energy inputs. And then what do our energy offices get back from this? Uh, they get energy savings. What do the PIs get back from this? Uh, our principal invest investigators gain new knowledge. They uh, exercise their unique tools in different ways, which helps them improve those tools. And it allows them to think about new things, which always uh, lead to something else, which is very interesting. So what are the issues that are facing industry out there? Well, much of the low hanging fruit for optimization, for example, of material projects and processes, are, it's already taken. And some of the new innovation directions are not necessarily obvious to them. So another uh, issue that I just mentioned is uh, in process control. Some of the sensors, um, cannot survive in high heat or high corrosive environments. And so they have to use uh, modeling. Sometimes with these expensive processes, uh, they find that it's very risky for them to change a high volume production uh, midstream. So can you imagine you're running a bunch of molten steel down the chute? Well, you can't stop that molten chute, steel running down the chute to tweak up your machine all the time. It's just, uh, economically infeasible. And so you really need to buy down the risk doing these um, high value, high value models. We find that um, companies out there do not necessarily have the expertise to run in new directions. Some of them have pared down their staff for cost cutting uh, reasons and they may have one CFD person, for example, but then they've come up 
to something in some other problem that requires new physics. Okay, they don't necessarily have that kind of talent on staff. So, so we help out with that. And for very new processes, for example, I have a manufacturer, there's a huge amount of computational work that goes into these new processes and getting to them to actually produce the quality uh, types of products every single time that it's used, a huge amount of computational expertise and so one single company can't uh, can't take on that entire task itself so a program like this helps out in all these uh, areas all these issues that uh, uh, industry is facing out there we work within an ecosystem of course universities are part of that ecosystem whether they're developing new algorithms uh, doing workforce development uh, they work with the national laboratories the national laboratories uh, have the advantage that many of our computationalists, uh, as I said before, literally spend their entire careers uh, doing uh, this type, a type of methodology. And so, and so they've managed to develop it over that time and, and are true experts in it. And so they also work at a very high uh, techni technical readiness level, whether it's basic um, code development all the way up to uh, production work. And then the companies, need to uh, go further with the uh, technical readiness uh, level so that they can actually get these things out on the street and make money. So this program uh, funds uh, the national laboratories and uh, some subcontracts universities to work with uh, various companies. So uh, we have executed over uh, 100 projects so far in this portfolio a wide range of companies, over 50 companies, uh, including the leading aerospace companies like GE, uh, Rolls-Royce and their engines, uh, Boeing, those sorts of companies, uh, to legacy companies in the steel industry, um, in chemical industry, and down also to small innovative com companies like FAST that, that does uh, new types of uh, turbines for energy generation or ACT Assist that's doing uh, small little devices to, to modify the airflow on trucks to, to uh, make the trucks more efficient, aerodynamically efficient. So uh, a huge variety of um, companies we have been working with. So what kind of problems does, does industry ask us to do? Well, here's one of our earlier projects that we worked on with GE. Uh, when they first came to us, they had limited computational resources and they would have to take break up the modeling of their jet engines into various pieces. When they did that, uh, well, knitting together those pieces leads to inaccuracies in the overall model. So we were able to do the entire engine at one time and increase the accuracy by using uh, LES modeling. And so they were able to get a fine resolution over a large uh, domain. This also allowed them to make arguments to their management to buy a bigger computer, which they have done actually. Another project uh, developing algorithms for uh, paint spraying. So uh, you think a lot of these industrial processes are very prosaic, turns out they aren't. <laughs> so in this case, this was PPG, uh, Pittsburgh Paint and Glass. They do a lot of paint uh, development for the automobile industry and you can get for house paint if you go down to your local hardware store. Uh, but in this case, they were looking at these electrostatic bell uh, paint sprayers. And uh, they, what happens here is they have a bell which rotates at literally thousands of RPM. And the paint comes out in a very thin sheet on that bell and then breaks up into these little atomistic uh, or little droplets and uh, then goes on the car. Well, it turns out the size of the droplets has a huge impact on the appearance of the paint. And they wanted to be able to understand uh, if they were going to make a paint with a, that they could paint these cars faster, what kind of viscosities they needed, um, what other properties of the paint they needed to get the paint to uh, give the right appearance on the car. So uh, they didn't have that kind of expertise in house. So they worked with uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs in this case uh, to develop uh, simple and complex algorithms to, uh, to estimate 
what the paint size distribution would be uh, under a lot of different conditions uh, for their particular process, a very advanced development process. So here's another thing uh, that was done at LLNL. I alluded to using uh, machine learning these days in scientific computing. And, uh, and again, so this was glass manufacturer and in glass manufacturer, the molten glass, again, is very high temperature, very corrosive. You cannot put too many sensors in your glass, uh, in your glass manufacturer furnace. So they typically run uh, CFD codes when the process went out of control and they were creating a lot of scrap glass. But it took them about a week to make one run uh, of this of their code. It's a specialized code uh, designed specifically for this purpose, and so they would be producing scrap for a week while while they're waiting for the code to run. So uh, Victor Theo here at Livermore, who's been doing a lot of machine learning stuff, uh, took several of the CFD runs. He put it into his uh, machine learning training tool and came up with a reduced order model based on this uh, to run instead of taking one week to run uh, the code ran in less than two minutes and consequently he can put that into again the control loop uh, real-time process control loop for this which uh, again is a huge paradigm shift it's pretty amazing and since he's done that we've gotten all sorts of companies interested in doing a very similar thing AK Steel, Arconic, uh, US Steel, um, SPF Power is a power company that uh, does a lot of uh, work with the coal coal industry and coal power plants. Uh, we're, we're just getting a huge amount of various uh, interest from various industrial par industrial partners on this. And then we also have a lot of people ask us about uh, material design. In this case, it's uh, looking at corrosion resistant materials that go into coal power, power plants, but aerospace is also interested in uh, corrosion. It's, uh, these are processes that take, down, take place at the atomic level, as you can imagine. Um, interactions with, uh, with um, water and oxides on the top surface how things migrate down through uh, the, to, through the protective layers on various uh, materials. Uh, there's a lot of a very uh, sophisticated uh, atomistic level computation that goes into these problems. So, um, and so we work at all ranges of scales. Uh, this looks at additive manufacture. So in additive manufacture uh, problem, we know that there's a lot of uh, parts of doing the process. In this case, it's the laser powder bed uh, uh, additive manufacturing process where we're working with a huge number of companies uh, looking at modeling the powder spread. And, and the powder spread has a very strong uh, impact on, on defects looking at the melt when the laser comes down and melts the uh, particulates, looking at microstructure growth, which impacts the, um, the, the properties at the continuum level. And for aerospace companies and medical companies who are using this uh, in particular, they really have to understand uh, both the geometry and the, the material microstructure growth so that they can be comfortable putting their products into very um, demanding use scenarios. Uh, they don't want anything to break, as you can imagine. And in a situation where everything is a one-off design, a one-off build, as it is in added manufacture, you have to carefully do cross control, check every part of the process, do a lot of modeling, and uh, do all that sort of stuff so you, you know that, that you're building quality parts at the end of the day. And there's just uh, an enormous amount of modeling going into this process development. And our projects uh, help companies do that. So that's the brief overview. Uh, if you're interested, please visit us at our website. Uh, you can just 
Google, mm -hmm. HPC for energy innovation, HPC for manufacturing, or HPC for materials, and uh, you will come up with our website. Robin, do you oh, want to take uh, questions now on this, or do you want to wait until after uh, my presentation is done? Um, if there, I'll take any brief questions, but then we want to hop into Aaron's thing. Well, the only question I have is, uh, what, what is the mechanism for the universities to participate? Mm. So universities can be subcontractors to, uh, to a project. So the applicant for our submissions, proposal submissions, are actually industry partners. And uh, industry partners uh, actually don't need to name any of the laboratory uh, partners at the time that they do the application. We actually do a match with them. Um, if they're working with a university partner, they can put that down and, uh, and we can arrange for subcontracts to uh, universities through the national laboratories. The actual person who gets the funding is the national laboratory. But we have had several projects which have involved university partners. But the, the initiative come from the industry partner. The, the primary respondent is, is an industry partner. Okay, thanks. Okay, Aaron, did you wanna talk about yeah, yourself? Let, yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, I will stop share. Okay. It says host has disabled participant screen sharing. So I might need to, you might need to give me screen sharing permissions. That might be you, Jose. There you go. Which account are you using? You think you have two of them? Oh, uh, the the one that's connected with that doesn't have a. Uh... Is it Fisher Forty Seven? Yeah, Fisher Forty Seven would be the right one. Okay, let me give it to you. Yeah. All right, you should be ready. Wonderful. Thank you. Let me do this and share. All right, so uh, I'm Aaron Fisher. Um, I um, was the first PI uh, that, was, that uh, ran projects out of this HPC for Manufacturing program. Um, I've been at it for uh, quite a while. Um, I'm, uh, I, my training um, is actually um, some more in numerical analysis um, and software construction. Um, so my training, uh, I did a lot of um, computational electromagnetics um, and uh, built codes uh, that did the computational micromagnetics and then uh, uh, later uh, got more interested in um, applications um, and applying the um, applying all of this uh, this mathematics that I've learned over the years to uh, to real problems um, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and sort of you know start from the the sort of the you know twenty thousand foot perspective that Robin uh, just gave us, and I'm going to dive down into um, how someone like me puts together a research program uh, with projects along these lines, um, and sort of dive down into uh, one of those projects. Um, so in particular, um, I've been working with the steel industry in all of my applications, um, and uh, uh, so this this particular application um, is a hot strip uh, mill rolling. Um, I've also worked with uh, steel, the steel blast furnaces um, and uh, the smelting, smelting technologies as well. Um, but uh, I'll focus on hot strip mills right now. Okay, so uh, what is a hot strip mill and why do we care? Um, so hot strip, uh, after the steel has been cast, um, so you smelt the steel and you alloy it, um, and then you cast it into these long, uh, these long things we call billets. Um, the um, pretty much all of the steel in the United States has been um, rolled into sheet metal. Uh, so what they need is a uniform thickness of steel at the right uh, with the right microstructural properties um, to meet the strength, strength and ductility specs um, that they're looking at. 
Um, so they're rolling at, uh, at high temperatures, so they heat them up. You can see one of these things um, on the left here, uh, it's kind of glowing. Um, the, uh, so they, uh, and then they, they run it through a series of rollers um, and roll it out into sheet metal. Um, so that's, that's, that's what, we're, what, we're, what we're interested in. But why are we interested? Uh, the, uh, so steel production is, is the fourth largest energy consumer in the United States. Um, so it, it accounts for, uh, you know, on the order of 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Rolling in particular um, consumes uh, um, upwards of 0.15 quads um, per year, which is about the same amount of power uh, as 4 million homes uses. So these industrial processes are huge levers for energy savings and for greenhouse gas savings. So, um, it's really... Uh, it's really astounding at how much how much energy they use. Um, and a, a, a tidbit that I've taken from the industry is that a five percent yield loss is considered acceptable um, in this uh, in, in this realm. So what that means is they've gone through all the effort to to mine ore, extract the iron out of the ore, alloy it, cast it, roll it, and then they're going to throw five percent of it away. There's an enormous amount of, of, of energy just on the table, um, just uh, just waiting to be uh, to waiting to be extracted. So uh, this is this is sort of my pictorial overview of what the rolling process looks like. Um, so you start with uh, what, I, what these these slabs um, at roughly uh, 1250 C. Um, they uh, they actually um, they actually move the slabs from one one area over to another area across the, across a river actually um, in the in the mill that I toured um, uh, so the, the slabs are actually allowed to cool after they're cast and then warmed back up so there's actually energy savings there but we didn't really look into that but anyway these these um, these, these slabs are, are reheated back up to 1250 C um, and then they're they're run through um, a series of what they call roughing uh, roughing rollers um, so these bring the slab from about uh, 20 centimeters thick to, to three centimeters thick. Um, there are also side rollers that you can see here. I don't think you guys can see my pointer, unfortunately, but uh, there are side rollers that keep the, um, the width of the uh, slab the same. Um, so you, they run through the roughing mill. Um, they do a little bit of measurement on the temperature after the roughing mill so that they, 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 um, they, double check to make sure their properties are where they think they should be. Um, and then they run through what's called the finishing mill. So it's roughly 10 sets of rollers and they roll it down to your usual sheet metal thickness of, of uh, about 0.2 centimeters. After that, they, they uh, drop um, a bunch of water on it uh, and uh, cool it down to about 600 C. Um, this, is, this is particularly important because this is where most of the microstructural evolution happens. Um, so this is where the strength properties of, uh, of most steels are being, um, being determined. Um, and then uh, after that, they coil it up and they, uh, they set it down in a room with a bunch of warm coils of, of, uh, of steel. Um, and then later they'll set it down for some chemical processing, what they call pickling line and any kind of cold rolling they're going to do afterward. Um, so this is the process um, that I, I became interested in and we're, uh, looking at trying to gain some of the energy back and some of the yield back um, in, and in these processes working with the steel industry. Um, so when we first looked at this, we, uh, we started digging into what are the mechanisms of yield loss um, in these hot strip mills. Um, so one of, the, one of the ones that actually kind of surprised me was that they, they actually frequently innovate the chemistry of their steel. Um, uh, and, and so steel isn't just one material, it's really a class of materials. And uh, every time they develop a new steel, they, they do pull tests and, and um, uh, mechanical tests in the laboratory to get the strength properties of that steel. Um, but going from those strength properties um, to uh, what settings they need on the mill to, uh, to roll this thing successfully is, uh, is more of an art than a, than a science um, in the current state of the art. So currently they, they run a bunch of trials. So they actually run a bunch of steel through their mill and, um, and sort of tune their process to actually um, correctly roll that steel. And as you can see, uh, the picture on the right-hand side uh, past all the beakers here, this is what happens when it goes wrong. Um, so when it goes wrong, they'll, they'll like fling 
you know, molten hot steel all over the, all over the floor of their, um, their factory. Um, people, uh, the people in the steel industry say it's basically like a, a lightsaber trying to kill you. And, um, and they have to shut the whole thing down and scrap all of that steel and then try it again with a different set of, set of mill settings. Um, so that's a, um, this was, this was a pretty surprising one to me. Um, another, um, another, uh, Yield boss um, mechanism that they uh, that they run into is that the edges of the um, of the uh, the slab tend to cool faster than the center of the slab, which makes a lot of sense, right? The edges there's there's more surface area to volume ratio there. There's more cooling that can happen through your usual mechanisms of radiation and convection um, and the water cooling. Um, so and they try to they try to tune their process a little bit um, the, by spraying a little less water toward the edges, but um, uh, again that's a sort of process tuning parameter. Um, and the uh, when they're done rolling the steel, the um, the edges don't meet, meet the strength spec because they were cooled faster and the microstructural evolution was different in them. And sometimes it's bad enough um, on the edges. Uh, especially when they're rolling a new kind of steel, um, like in the previous examples, uh, sometimes it's bad enough that those edges are really embrittled and they will crack um, and fling pieces off. Again, again, as a safety hazard and uh, and a yield hazard. Um, and then finally, um, the uh, the strength. Uh, some a lot of the time, the strength specs on the front and the back um, don't uh, don't meet spec either. Um, for uh, they, the, the way the roll bites on the front um, matters in that case. Um, and um, the uh, temperature changes um, as you come to the front and the back of the roll matter in, in that case as well. Um, so they, uh, that they, they actually have to trim the front and the back off um, in order to, to meet the spec on the steel they're shipping out. So, um, Given given the mechanisms we have for running projects like this, we can't solve all the problems in one in one project. It's, it's just too big, right? Um, the uh, the HPC for manufacturing projects um, only go up to 300k, so we we kind of broke uh, looking at these problems into multiple smaller projects um, with different funding mechanisms. Um, so the first uh, the first one um, we ran, um, we call this the, the phase one project. Um, and we did, we did what's called a direct, we did a direct, direct contract with US Steel um, to work on this. Um, and uh, they have some modeling um, um, capabilities, um, but all their modeling capabilities are 1D. Um, so we, we ran a project uh, with them in order to build up a 2D modeling uh, capability for them. Um, so they were, uh, and uh, I can, I'm gonna tell you um, a lot more about that particular project actually. Um, that's the one I'm gonna focus in on from uh, after this slide. Um, we're currently running um, this U.S. Steel uh, Phase Two project, um, and in this Phase Two project, we're we're going to be um, tackling the uh, the edge to edge variation problem, um, and we are tackling it with uh, the sort of the best tools we've got at Lawrence Livermore. So we're using Livermore uh, existing um, CFD software. Um, to, uh, to, to model this problem in 3D um, with uh, the contact and roll interactions. It's actually quite a tough problem. We're making good progress, um, and that project is, um, is in flight right now. Um, another project in flight right now as well, um, we are also uh, working with AK Steel um, and uh, looking into um, building uh, reduced order models of these 3D models that we're making. Um, and trying to uh, to use the reduced order models um, to improve the um, the uh, spec of the steel in the front to back variation, so they don't have to cut as much off the front and the back. Um, and that's another project that's currently in flight. I'm not going to talk too much more about that. Um, but again, it's it's working with the machine learning um, uh, methods that uh, Robin uh, mentioned uh, earlier in the, uh, in the talk. So, uh, like I said, I'm going to I'm going to zoom in on this uh, this phase one project that we already ran. Uh, it's it's run to completion at this point, um, and it's again it's focused on uh, improving their 1D modeling to 2D modeling. Um, gives them all, gives them the side to side variation, um, and trying to avoid running into problems in their uh, with their new grades of steel 
um, going sideways and uh, and uh, uh, reducing the number of mill trials they need to zero in on on um, on their process for a new grade of steel. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, U.S. Steel has an existing in-house model. It's very, very simple. It's a, it's a 1D uh, through thickness uh, thermal mechanical model. Um, so uh, it, it deform, it's, it's a basically it's looking at the slab right in the center of the slab with just a few points across the center of the slab as it deforms and cools uh, sort of through this process, right? Um, they do use the, the mechanical response data that they get from their pull tests um, and their mechanical tests uh, in the laboratory um, so that the, the slab does um, respond uh, physically uh, in, in, in a way that, uh, uh, that can be tracked and varies with the different grades of steel that they put in there. So if they had a little more uh, sophistication and they had more dimensionality in their, their model, there's a good chance they could avoid some of these mill trials that, um, that I mentioned before. So this, um, this 1D model also, they also include what, what I call point structure, point-wise microstructural evolution model. Um, so it's, an, it's a microstructural evolution model that doesn't have any spatial variations in it. It just, it's like, it's temperature and stress over time. Uh, it tells you what uh, what your microstructural structural um, state's going to look like um, over time, um, and this this one D model it runs fast enough for their for real time analysis, and they use it on the factory floor um, for sort of their day to day needs. Um, but again, it's unable to capture any edge to edge variation, um, and um, and a lot of the time something going on at the edge cracking or something along those lines is what leads to these uh these very very bad states where they they have to stop the whole line and hopefully nobody gets hurt <clears throat> so the uh the, the work we we did here is we we built a a 2d modeling capability again um, we wanted to capture the edge to edge variation um, this model, it, it's, uh, it includes uh, heat conduction, radiative losses, convective losses, and contact losses. Um, and it, runs it still runs fast enough for real-time analysis. Uh, computers have come a long way since they put their 1D model together. So um, we, you know, they only had nine points, and now, now they have, you know, uh, it was uh, uh, a few thousand, and it's still okay, right? So they, they can still get it done in a few seconds. Um, and again, it captures the edge-to-edge -edge variation and predicts the temperature versus time, stress versus time, and microstructure versus time, uh, microstructure versus time using their microstructural model. Um, since I'm I'm actually a, um, I'm a numerics guy, so these these are the uh, these are the software libraries we use. They're both internal libraries um, at Lawrence Livermore. Um, so the, uh, the the equations were discretized um, with uh, MFEM. It's our it's our flagship finite element um, library here um, at Lawrence Livermore. It's open source. Um, if you're interested, you can you can find it. I'm also a developer on that project. Um, so this was this project was a very very well suited uh, for that. We also um, used Lawrence Livermore's hyper library. Uh, you may be familiar with this one. It's a it's a linear solver library. It's, um, and it's got an, an algebraic multigrid capability that's um, uh, world class at solving problems um, with uh, with discretizations that look like this um, uh, in very very few iterations. Um, again, both these libraries are open source. Um, they're extensible to HPC clusters, and uh, they both support GPU programming, um, which is a, a relatively new development. Um, they've both been used extensively in problems along these lines, um, and. Uh, uh, after um, sort of putting together this this li this this library, uh, we put it together into a DLL for them. Um, they're running all their code on Windows, um, and they they spliced it in with their thermal thermal uh, their their mechanical um, uh, model, um, and uh, and we got good results out of it. And because I usually don't put any equations um, in my in my talks uh, when I'm talking with the uh, uh, the folks in industry, um, but because we have some computational folks here, uh, I thought I'd just throw these throw these equations in here. So all, all we were doing was we were solving the uh, a two dimensional heat equation. Um, we discretized it with a, a finite element method um, uh, with uh, H zero elements. Um, they were just they were only uh, they were only first order, um, and then. Um, 
uh, used the uh, used the, uh, the hyper library uh, to uh, invert the invert the system. Um, so if you've got any more detailed questions about this, uh, I'm I'm happy to dive into that. But uh, other than that, I believe oh nope, there was there's one more slide. Uh, so after um, we we delivered this capability um, to them, um, they pulled it into their um, into their their existing modeling capability um, and then tested it um, up against data off the line. Um, and uh, we, uh, we compared very, very favorably uh, to the data off the, data off the line. Um, and uh, we uh, also uh, are, you know, pretty much our, our center line of temperature matched up with their 1D calibrated models as well. Um, so they were extremely happy uh, with the new capability. Um, they uh, they plan on using this um, in their next series of mill trials um, to try and help them cut down the number of mill trials they're going to use. Um, that has not happened yet, unfortunately, with with uh, the COVID situation. Not quite sure when their next set of mill trials is going to be, um, but I'm uh, I'm uh, waiting with interest. Um, if I, uh, just to give you an idea of um, how big of an impact this could be, if they could cut the number of mill trials they need to use by, by half, they'd save $3 million per year and, and, uh, and not have to re-scrap 20,000 tons of steel per year. So it's a huge lever working um, in projects like this. And that's one of the things I really like um, about working with these, these um, in industrial projects. There's, um, there's a lot of meat there to go after. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. I have a, a question that I noticed in your diffusion equation, the K seems to be constant. It is. Yes, yes, the K in this, in this diffusion equation is constant. And for the, uh, the, the their variation in, um, the variations in the temperatures that they have, uh, their K is, is, is constant across those temperatures. You know, I, I know that, but uh, is yeah. that, uh, uh, Realistic. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, so for the, the the values that they have, uh, it it does not vary much across uh, the, okay. the temperature across the temperature range that they're looking at. Now, if you're talking about if you were talking about like, you know, if you're modeling a stars or you know something really hot, right, with vast vast temperature changes, yeah, it okay. it, it would make a difference. Okay. But in this in this case, yeah, they only have they only. They only use and they only they, and they only use one value of k in their one D models too. Oh. They were calibrating against that. So, but yeah, if you if you look in the literature, the variation of k um, in steel is 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 not very much between a thousand centigrade and you know a hundred centigrade, which is the range we're looking at. I have a question. Okay, so for this rolling problem, um, mm -hmm. um, do you consider the the natural convection effect? For the cooling of your uh, plate, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't go into it, but um, there were uh, four different cooling mechanisms. Uh, there was uh, convection, um, <laughs> radiation to the environment, which is actually, which was actually larger than the convection because um, okay. the stuff is glowing, right? Yes. If you put your hands near it, you'll, you'll feel it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was the water cooling um, in mm -hmm. the water cooling phase, and uh, there's also also modeled um, the contact cooling when it's when it when it's touching the rolls. Yes, they keep they keep the rolls at room temperature, so they they actually water cool the rolls to keep them at room temperature, and and uh, it it actually loses quite a bit. Um, it also gains a little bit of heat um, due to the deformation as well due to the plastic work, um, and that was also accounted for. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, hi, this is Terrence McGinnis. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, I, um, with so many broad a number of projects and a lot of lessons learned, it looks like is kind of key outcome of what you guys are kind of, uh, going for. What kind of providence uh, data and uh, um, the processes do you have for persistence of uh, transfer? Yeah. You, you, you cut out a little bit at the back end of that can you can you repeat some of that what kind of something data right i was uh, the back end is kind of where i was getting at 
Uh, do you guys have uh, processes for uh, data persistence and provenance for technical transfers for the takeaways that you have in these various projects? So a little bit. Um, we uh, so the PIs tend to hold on to their data, um, and then the PIs use what they learn in future mm -hmm. projects, right? So I've I've actually exclusively focused on steel projects. Um, so it was kind of a heavy lift to come up on the steel industry um, as a, you know, as a numerical guy, you know, I didn't know a lot about steel. Um, so we, we use a lot of that. Um, a lot of the time, because we're working with companies, however, the data is proprietary. Right. So we can't just like shove the data uh, into another project. Um, they, they really don't want the, you know, we work with, we work across competitive lines, right? We work, we're working with U.S. Steel and AK Steel, right? Um, but so we can't. But what we learned, the learning definitely, definitely applies crossways. Um, the, the reduced order modeling in particular, you know, they, they tried it out once on, on, on one glass furnace and now we've got multiple glass furnaces um, that are using, you know, projects that are, that are doing the same thing because it works so well. And we're also cross fertilizing that into the steel, into the steel industry as well, so. Right, and the lessons learned is the, is the persistence of that and being able to do the technical transfer is really key, I think. Uh, do you guys have a way in which you try to maintain that uh, uh, back knowledge? Uh, really, it's mostly through our PIs. Uh -huh. uh, through, through our PIs and our, manage, and our management, keeping an eye on the different projects and keeping the PIs that we use looped in on these, right? right? Um, we're also, um, so there's no, we don't really have a formal process, but the PIs also do quite a bit of training of, of younger folks. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that, you know, like that as this pro as these projects go forward, they'll they'll slowly come up to speed as well, right? right. Um, so yeah, but no, we don't have any like formal documentation or, or formal process for that. Um, it might be worth looking into because um, it's kind of all existing in our brains right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some of the materials projects, uh, those, those folks are actually publishing things, but for most of the projects, there are, there are no published results. And right. that would conflict with the CRADA agreements that we have with the various companies. So, so when it comes to the PIs, though, I mean, most, uh, most computationalists at the laboratory spend, as I said, spend their careers at the laboratory. So there is that persistence there. Right. And the material sciences community have a lot of data lakes in various ways they Use uh, the system that formalize the way in which they store a lot of their uh, key uh, variables for instantiating their uh, memory inputs and stuff. Yeah, in in material groups, some of them may do that. We don't keep track of we don't keep right. track of that. Right. That's I see that the, there there has been a I, I know I've seen proposals for materials projects where they they were building a database of of like material state based right. on alloy composition or something like that, right. and right. one of the goal one of the goals was to publish that. Um, so it's not an unheard of, but it's not it's not every project either. Right, and they have a I think a, a, a workflow system like Fireworks based on Python that a lot of the material science using community. Uh, PIs use uh, in concert with one another. Yeah, it really is. It really is kind of on a PI by PI and project by project basis. So, mm -hmm. so I'd like to interject a question about the machine learning and the control. Mm -hmm. um, so one of these I'm envisioning, maybe it's my mental picture that's wrong, but uh, one of these mill runs you made the chosen the settings based on whatever prior information. Now you presumably get to measure the outcome and then you feed, you retrain a network or you train a whole new network or how do you go about feeding back that information to improve the next trial? Yeah, so, uh, so do you mean for, uh, for, the, for machine learning in particular? Yeah, the how do you incorporate machine learning in the control loop? That's the uh, yeah, yeah. So it's so so we build what are called reduced order models, um, and uh, so what we're doing in in that case is you've got a simulation model that you trust, right? 
um, that you trust to give you the right answer. You run it hundreds and thousands of times, hundreds or hundreds or, or thousands of times at different, you know, kind of in a box of mill settings, right? And then you train your machine learning algorithms on the input and output, you know, the input state and the output data of those simulations. And then the, the, that neural net becomes a stand-in for, uh, for the actual simulation itself, right? Um, they can also use some data um, uh, from, the, um, from the process itself also to help train, um, train the output as well. Um, so they put, these, they, they put these together. And basically what you get at the end of the day is you get an approximation to your model but instead of taking a week to run, it takes a minute to run, right? Because it's, you're just running it through a neural network. Yeah, okay, but when, um, when I heard the description of active involvement in the control loop, I thought there was some hint that maybe some of the time you take what the control loop gave and feed it back and change the neural net or the machine learning system. So yeah, so we're not currently doing any active learning um, like that. Um, okay, that's that's something we could look look at in the future, but it's um, right now mostly we're, we're we're going after this low hanging fruit approach, right? Where it's you you really already have a model you trust, right? And and it's just it takes too long for you to use it for your in your control loop. So you 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 basically extract the most important parts of the model by using the machine learning techniques. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm not the expert on, on that, but I, you know, I am familiar with the technique. Thank you. So, so the output of your model can be basically substitute for your sensor data, which you can then use uh, to, uh, to adjust your control points. If that's what you're asking. Well, no, I was asking, do you then retrain or do you add an example and train a little further or do you just train on that example? That's what I was, it, it's the, the real-time involvement that sound, especially as, as it required possibly retuning the net. That I was yeah, so, so these projects, so in particular, the problem is they, the problem is the, the building of the neural net is the really expensive part. Right, it requires lots and lots of the simulation runs and the data, right? Um, and then they that all gets digested in the supercomputer, right? And uh, by training the neural net over I don't, I, over many, many, many iterations, right? And then you give them the ROM, and they run it on a Windows box, right? So they don't have the horsepower really to retrain the net as they go. Well, except that you don't need to retrain the whole thing. You just have a little bit more info. And yeah, yeah, it's, 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 a, that. it's a possibility. Yeah, it's a possibility. I, 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 could, I could see it. I could see getting some pay dirt out of that. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Um, so one of the strengths of machine learning, right, is that you could extract behavior from noise. So in your simulations, did you have any kind of randomness in the final output that you were feeding into the model? And if not, what kind of accuracy did your machine learning algorithm get compared to the truth you're giving it? Yeah, so I, um, I haven't done these, these machine learning techniques myself. However, I do, I do know a little bit about them. So let me, let me take a crack at it. Um, so one of the things they do in these machine learning, uh, in, in this ROM building exercise is because you don't want to run a million simulations, right? You only want to run a few thousand. They take the few thousand simulations and what, do what they call the data amplification, which basically they add some noise to them, right? Um, and um, they add some noise and they do things like flip, flip the dimensions of them um, to, to create more data for the neural network to train on. Um, and, uh, and the, uh, uh, without having to run all the simulations. Now, the, in terms of the, um, the accuracy, um, I know they get like 95% plus, 
um, accuracy uh, when you look at like the one of the, like the L2 norm or something along those lines. So it's they they do get very quite accurate results um, by using this technique. Now, of course, that's going to depend on you know what you're modeling. If you're modeling something that's highly nonlinear, you know, got a lot of ins and outs on it, it might not do as well. Um, but on the problems that they've uh, that they've been running with uh, running them. Uh, so far with, uh, they've, they've been getting really good results. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, complaints, compliments? <laughs> All complaints, I'm sure. <laughs> well, if there is no more questions, I want to Thank you, uh, Robin and Aaron, for a very, very interesting presentation. I think that uh, I, will, I will see if we can identify some industrial partners to see if we can participate in this. Absolutely, yeah. And th thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Jose. Thank you.